Okay, good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Eddie Portnoy. Uh, I'm the academic advisor at the uh, Max Weinreich Center at the Evo Institute for Jewish Research. And uh, today we have uh, another fellowship lecture. Uh, our, uh, the fellowship today is, um, or the fellowship that's funding Today's lecture is the uh, Alexander and, and Alicia Hertz Memorial Fellowship, as well as the Samuel and Flora Weiss Research Fellowship. Um, we can't provide these uh, uh, these lectures without this funding, uh, and the researchers depend on it. So we very much appreciate uh, the generosity of the uh, of the funders. So thank you, thank you kindly. Our uh, lecturer today is uh, Dr. Kamil Kiek. Uh, he uh, works in the Taubu Department of Jewish Studies at the University of uh, uh, Wrocław. Uh, Camille is, uh, uh, has been a Prince Foundation postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Jewish History in New York and a Soslin Family Fellow at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Museum in, War in Washington, D.C. Uh, his publications include Dietzi uh, Modernismo, uh, Children of Modernism, Socializ Socialization and Political Consciousness of Jewish Youth in Interwar Poland, uh, which was published in, in Wrocław in 2017. Uh, he's also published a number of articles, uh, including Was It Possible to Avoid Hebrew Assimilation? Uh, Hebraism, Polonization, and the Zionist Tarbut School System in the Last Decade of Interwar Poland which appeared in Jewish Social Studies. Uh, he also published uh, Between Love of Poland, Symbolic Violence and Antisemitism on the Idiosyncratic Effect of the State Education System Among Jewish Youth in Interwar Poland, uh, and that appeared in Pauline in 2018. Also in 2018, uh, Dr. Kiek received an international prize for an outstanding publication in the, on the topic of Jews and illiberal regimes in Eastern Europe after 1917, uh, and that was granted by the Leonid Nevzlin Research Center for Russian and East European Jewry at the Hebrew University for his book, uh, Dietzi Modernismo. His current research pro uh, project, and that which you'll be hearing about, is entitled uh, Polish Shtetl After the Holocaust, Jews in uh, Dzierżoniu. Dier <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Dzierżoniu. I'll never get it. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, 1945 to 1950. You'll hear better from uh, Dr. Kiek. Uh, please um, join us in welcoming him. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. We'll have a bit of time after for questions. Uh, so please place your questions in the question and answer se section, and hopefully we'll get to them. Thank you very much, Eddie, for this uh, generous uh, invitation. And before I will share my presentation, my PowerPoint presentation, I just wanted to thank Ivo for this fellowship that actually right now uh, helps me or enables me to write the book about which I will be talking about, about the concept of the book, and also about all the previous opportunities that uh, enabled me to research fascinating material that there is in Evo archives that partially I will share uh, today with you uh, on my uh, screen. So before I start, uh, just let me to start my uh, PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint presentation. Mm. Uh, here it is. Eddie, could you just confirm that you can see it, that everything is fine? Yes, we can see it. Everything's fine. Perfect. Go, go right okay. ahead. Thank you. So as you see, the title of my talk and the, probably the title of my book will be The Last Polish Title, Jewish Community of Dzierżoniów, Jewish World, Cold War and Communism, 1945-1950. And as I try to suggest already in the title of, uh, of the book and of the project, it is not a local history. That means history concentrated on a events on very detailed kind of story, one particular place, but it's rather an attempt to, to show some general processes happening in to, to Polish Jews in, in, in post-Holocaust Poland, but also some processes happening all over the Jewish world through the history of one particular place and the people living in a particular space. That is Dzierżoniów, or much easier to pronounce as it was uh, um, called by Jews and Poles after 1945, at the beginning, Rychbat. That is a small town in Lower Silesia, in today's uh, southwestern Poland, that before the war 
it was uh, in German. And as I said, to the history of the Jewish community of this uh, town in the first five years after the Second World War and the Holocaust, I want to show some main, some processes, general processes of Cold War, of communism, and the change in the Jewish world after the Holocaust. How can they be observed through this one uh, particular uh, place? And also to bring some new insights on the history of Zionism in Poland after the Holocaust, communism, Bundism, orthodoxy, and so on and so on. And of course, also history of Polish-Jewish relations just after the Second World War. And in order to do that, I need to start speak about the story and about the particular town that for sure was special in the post-Holocaust landscape, not only of Poland, but uh, of whole Central Eastern or uh, Eastern Europe. Now the post-war uh, post Polish Jewish story of a former German uh, town starts during the Second World War because uh, Reichenbach, uh, as it was called at the time, the town in a German territory because it was a part of Germany uh, until 1945, was a place of Sportschule concentration camp, which was a part of Cross Rosen uh, concentration camp network. And when it was freed or occupied by the uh, Red Army forces at the end of April and the beginning of May, 1945. It had few thousand, like altogether 10,000 Jewish prisoners, uh, mostly Polish Jews, but also Jewish prisoners from Netherlands, uh, Czechoslovakia and all other places uh, of Europe. And uh, as, as you may know, as all other European Jews, a few days, few weeks, after being freed from the concentration camp leave to, to go to, the, um, to their home, to their places where they were living, uh, many Polish Jews did not have a um, place where to go because these ones who were going back, they usually you know, met the ruins of their shtetls, of the, the, the neighborhoods of their towns, especially, I mean, here Warsaw Jews, that were many at the time uh, in the town. Their houses were taken, Many of them encountered violence. Some of them were even killed trying to retain their property or going back home. So paradoxically, also from this point of, from the standpoint of a new Polish communist state that was now taking over this territory, Polish Jews were the only Polish citizens or the majority of Polish citizens present in these former German territories. And they were the only Polish citizens who were really interested from the first day to stay. Uh, in this uh, in this place, and uh, as it was noticed also by the Central Col uh, Jewish Community uh, in Warsaw and the, by the Polish Communist government in Warsaw in June 1945, that there was um, regional Jewish Community formed uh, in this town, and Jewish Community started to grow because many of the Holocaust survivors from the Central Poland hearing about this you know, very Jewish kind of space, uh, and also by the help provided by uh, different agencies, started to come to the town. And then in June, in 1945, you have 2,000 people, 2,000 Jews uh, in, uh, in Reichenbach, yes, in the former German town Reichenbach. Uh, already in January 1946, you have 4,000 people. In June 1946, just before the Kielce pogrom, you have 12,000 Jews uh, in the town. And you see in the years 1947, 1949, following the big flight from Poland after the Kielce pogrom, this number stabilizes at 6,000, 7,000. And even after the great emigration of 1949, 1951, on which I, I actually finished my book, there is still 4,000 Jews in Dzierżoniów. And what is special is the proportion of the, of the Jewish inhabitants of the town next to the whole population. Now in the years 1945, 1946, uh, they were between 35 and 50% uh, of the, the town inhabitants. During the Kielce pogrom in July 1946, they were half of the old inhabitants of the town. And in 1947, 1951, this proportion was between 35 and 30%. As I said, making, making Dzierżoniów, uh, as it was now renamed by the Polish government, a uh, very unique place in whole uh, post, uh, uh, post Holocaust uh, war. And uh, this Jewish community, like all the other 
com like not all the other, but many other Jewish communities at the time in post Holocaust Poland was able to build an immensely dense network of different religious secular institutions. Uh, and as you can hear, see here, regional and county Jewish committees, uh, Jewish schools, both Yiddish and Hebrew, uh, cultural institutions, Zionist kibbutzim, but also uh, Jewish farms, cooperatives, kindergarten, children homes, uh, um, Zionist partisan organizations, uh, act, uh, of course, activists, uh, activists of JTC or Jewish Labour Committee and various uh, American Landsmannschaften were also active in the Dzierżoniów. The, the um, synagogue and Orthodox community, self-defense, social help and health care and uh, so on and so on. And as you will see just in a minute, I will show you my presentation. This was a tremendous um, phenomenon that astonished not only Polish Jews, who because of this density of the Jewish community, density both demographical and institutional density, came and tried to rebuild their lives after the Holocaust in Dzierżoniów, impressed not only them, but also many envoys from the Western Jewish world, from the other side of the Iron Curtain, that came to visit Poland after the end of the Holocaust, after uh, 1945. And you, as you can see also on, on these pictures and on the list of the institutions, it was also a Jewish life defined by limited, but still a pluralism on the level of politics, on the level of culture, uh, on the level of institutional organization, because, because you had um, Orthodox Jews still present and very much vivid uh, in the space of the town. You had, as you see in the uh, right down, around the right hand corner, you had also the activities of the Zionist parties. And I think it, it says a lot the uh, the the slogan, which is which was actually placed in the center of the town, praising uh, Mapai, that is me flag at Palais Eretz Israel, it is a um, land of Israel workers party, the biggest party of <coughs> in Israel of David Ben Gurion, being you know slogan present in the central space of the town. You had a Hebrew school, you had a Yiddish school, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You had also very strong presence of Yiddish language which was a very, very rare thing already in post-Holocaust Poland, and especially as what was underlined by both Polish and outside observers, Yiddish that was spoke openly in the street that uh, all these manifestations of Jewish identity, they were manifested openly with, with no fear, or at least with a lesser fear than in many other uh, parts uh, of uh, Poland. And this, I would say, social, demographical, cultural, and institutional density of the Jewish life can be also very much in this micro, micro historical study confirmed by the on the map, very much uh, that is on the map. And uh, you can see here on the map you know, how densely these institutions were located in the space on the town. And it's not a full map, not of these are not all the full institutions um, that, that, that they, they were active, but you can really see that um, in many ways the institutional structure and the structure of you know living in the town reminded many people of the interwar shtetl, and because of that you know it was called by many uh, at the time the last shtetl, the last Polish shtetl or the last uh, shtetl in Poland and. Uh, um, and uh, what I'm also showing in my research is that in these very special circumstances after the Holocaust, you had not only the desolation, the destruction, and total rebuilding of the life anew, but you also had some elements of continuation of pre-war Jewish culture in the new conditions of uh, post-Holocaust Poland. And um, as I'm trying to show by this quotation, which you can see on the screen and by, by the many quotations that I will show uh, in my book, this actually comes from the uh, Hashomer Hazeir archives in Givat Habiba, from one of the correspondents of Hashomer activists that was sent at the time to Palestine about you know, the trip of the kibbutz in the surrounding mountains um, and marching in the Shomer array. Now, if you look at the pictures, you know, if you look on the different descriptions of the Zionist culture and or Bundist culture uh, at the time, you can see how much there was a continuation of interwar, you know, political and cultural political patterns in this new space, post-German space in the uh, 
post uh, Holocaust uh, Poland. But I also forgot to say, of course, that all this was enabled by the transnationalism. That is by the tremendous transnational help of, by, of the world jewelry, especially by the American jewelry, because more than half of the budgets of all these organizations, both of the Jewish uh, committees dominated by the communists, with also very active Bundists in that, uh, but, and also by the Zionist parties, was financed by joint, by Jewish labor committee from New York. Orthodox institutions were very much financed, uh, financed by Abu Dhabi Israel and Bada Hatzalah. So that is from the very beginning, the transnational Jewish network and transnational Jewish financial help were crucial in the rebuilding of this uh, <coughs> Jewish life after the Holocaust. And again, it is not something new, but it's a con uh, kind of continuation of the interwar patterns or uh, interwar patterns of Jewish life in the very new reality of the uh, post uh, Holocaust uh, Poland. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, this uh, shtetl like, and of course, I don't mean it was a classical shtetl, but I would say this shtetl like or shtetl reminding um, social, political, and cultural reality made a tremendous impression on the different representatives of the Jewish world, and some of them very famous ones who visited town at the time. And here you have different correspondences from New York Times, from travelogues of Jan Pat, Joseph Tenenbaum, uh, <clears throat> Shmuel uh, Schneiderman or Shimon Samet, uh, uh, writing about their experiences uh, from Dzerzhonyov. And you can see, for example, in the Pat's quotation, this, this sentence, difference between Reichenbach and any other East European city was staggering, yes? Or what he says, <coughs> what, uh, what he writes below. I set foot in post-war Poland. I see a large sign saying in Yiddish community center. It is simply impossible to imagine such a sign in any other Polish city. Warsaw, Łódź, Białystok or Kraków, all great uh, Jewish centers was. Uh, but also, you can see ambivalence, yes? You can see what Shimon Sanet, the um, Eretz Israel correspondent of Haaretz newspaper, wrote in Hebrew in his correspondence from Poland about Dzerzhonyov. Uh, he called it, uh, he wrote it in a um, chapter that he called Birobidzian Hasheni, that is a second Birobidzian with a question mark, asking if it, it will mean, uh, if not this tremendous rebirth of the Jewish life that he experienced in Lower Silesia and particularly in Dzerzhonyov will be not the second uh, Birobidzian, uh, some humbug, some, you know, some trap that uh, will actually not enable these Jews finally to, to leave Poland. That, that, you know, or this community will finish like, um, I don't know, Jewish agriculture projects in Crimea and many other, you know, communities of this kind, um, of this kind in, uh, in Soviet Union. So that is what I'm trying to do also in the book. I'm trying to show how much and on the pages of New York Times, Forbes, Morgan Journal, and all these travelers, also on the pages of uh, Eretz Israel Press, there was a big discussion about the place which now Poland plays in the Jewish world after the Holocaust. Now, before the Holocaust, it was one of the centers of Jewish civilization. After the Holocaust, it's the biggest cemetery of the Jews in the whole world. But there was this big struggle between the main dominant discourse that this is a just cemetery, but also the discourse, that example of which I'm showing you on the screen, that maybe there is a still future in Poland for a small Jewish community that will be able to retain some elements of Polish Jewish civilizations. They are not, that, that you cannot uh, actually retain in the United States or in Israel, but you can retain them still in this new old Poland. And uh, as I'm showing in my book, I'm claiming in my book, this, this second discourse was relevant until 1949, 1950, or at least second half of 1948, where introduction of a fully Stalinist political system in uh, communist Poland, liquidation of this Jewish trans, uh, transnationalism that I'm showing you on the screen, and liquidation of all the pluralism of the Jewish life that caused also a big wave of immigration of the Jews to newly established Israel, that this and not the Kielce pogrom ended the belief in the Jewish world that there is some, uh, that there is some future 
for the Jews as a nation in Poland. So, um, so this is one of the main thesis of my book that I show actually on examples of this discourse around Dzierżonif and Lower Silesia taking place not in Polish, Jewish or communist press, but around the, uh, but around the Jewish war. Of course, not denying the voices of people like Samet or Mordechai Tsanin or uh, Isaac Beshebi Zinger, who are of course saying it's uh, just cemetery, yes, and Jews need to leave Poland. Uh, overall, I just what I'm actually trying to show that historic uh, that you know nobody knew in 1946 or 1947 what will happen later, and we should more concentrate on a state of mind, of on feelings and way of thinking people in the particular this uh, uh, historical moment, and not to interpret all the historic uh, history teleologically that is that it goes into one certain uh, direction. We shouldn't think about ourselves that you are wiser than these people who did not know what will uh, what will happen, and that is what I'm trying to do. Empathically look how people in 1945, 1946, 1947, before and after the pogrom in this particular space were giving meaning to the Holocaust, were giving meaning what is the new Poland, were giving meaning to the fact if I, my children, my family can if we can rebuild the, uh, the, our lives in post-Holocaust Poland. And of course, one important thing that I forgot to say, that most of the these representatives of the Jewish community that were living in the Dzierżonie for Rychba, for Reichenbach, in the years 1945-1950, were the Jewish repatriates or the Polish Jews who survived their war in Soviet Union and were repatriated to Poland in the first half of uh, 19, uh, 1940. Uh, six. Mm, uh, just sorry, my presentation froze, and I want to continue showing you uh, um, another picture. Just I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Um, also, um, uh, through this book, through this micro history. Of the one uh, Jewish community of the Jewish community of Dzierżonów, I want to show uh, some, you know, micro, in a, from the micro historical point of view, uh, some other phenomena important for the Jewish world after the Holocaust, not only for Poland. Uh, first is the issue of the Cold War, or the issue of uh, how Poland was built. Building the Polish communist state was building its presence on the territories now acquired by Germany, and how much it was using actually this rebuild of the Jewish community as a PR, as a public relations um, kind of you know uh, asset to uh, justify its presence um, and taking over the former uh, German territories. And if you, you here have a quotation. Uh, from uh, um, from the archives, of, from the documents of Ministry of Foreign Territories, as it was, you know, bringing all these uh, Jewish and non-Jewish uh, journalists from Britain, from the United States, from France, to this town, showing them how remarkable this community is, in order to justify Polish uh, presence in uh, Lower Silesia, which was very important during the. Uh, at the beginning, during the Potsdam Conference in the summer of 1945, and then in 1946, 1947 in the different Cold War discussions and struggles about the, you know, Polish Western uh, border. Also, uh, of course, to the study of activities of the Zionist parties uh, in Dzierżoniew and in Poland, and their uh, connections and interactions with the Zionist centers in Dipikans in Germany, or Zionist organization headquarters in Palestine, also show the dynamics of the Zionist movement in Poland. What I'm trying to show in the book that, of course, and for sure, all the Zionist organizations from uh, Hashem er Hatzair, even Polity on left, up to the illegal uh, revisionist movement, Ehud and general Zionists, all of them were convinced that there is no future for the Jews in Poland and all of the Polish Jews should, should leave. And when the opportunity will arise, they all, all should live in a newly created, like, in a future Jewish state in, uh, in Israel. Nevertheless, what I'm showing that the same activists, and I'm also meaning here not only the local activists, but people like Heike Grossman, Meir Yari, or Itzhak Tabenki, 
or uh, it's a green bond that you can see on the picture that visited Poland in the years 1945, 46, 47, and 48, all of them were convinced that yes, we need to take all the Jews out of Poland, but also they were convinced until 1948 and, or 1949, until Stalinism happened, that thousands of Jews, especially in places like Gerzonio, will actually stay despite their work. And for these who, who will stay, until communists with, will allow us the, uh, our activity, we should build the Zionist culture of the diaspora. We should develop Hebrew schools, and this happened in Gerzonium. We should um, uh, develop youth party organizations, uh, youth movements, uh, adult political party uh, headquarters, and so on and so on and so on. That is, we need to build the diaspora, uh, diaspora Hebrew Jewish culture, and it was paradoxically another paradox, kind of again continuation of the interwar patterns how the Zionism was functioning in Interpol. Exactly the same can be said about the Bund, uh, post-Holocaust Polish Bund, and about its very close relation, especially to um, uh, Jan Tefpat and Jewish uh, Labour Committee in New York, and very much using Kivo documents or uh, documents of Jewish Labour Committee that, that they are now based in the New York Tam NYU Taminant Library in New York, I show the same, exactly the same kind of thinking and the same building of the daily political culture of the Bund and JLC in Gerzoniów, again, until 1948, 1939, when the Stalinism cuts possibility of, uh, of uh, doing that. I also, of course, show that besides Zionism, Bundism, Communism, there was a kind of, you know, change in a way how, how, how Jews perceived, uh, especially Eretz Israel and Palestine, that you did not need to, uh, to, be bundi, uh, to be Zionist in order, you know, to look with great sympathy uh, on a Jewish national project that was built now in the Pal uh, Palestine. And you can see example of this uh, on a picture, on the right picture below, when you can see the Jerusalem Jewish community with Orthodox older people, with young people, and with middle-aged people listening to the Polish radio, 29th of November, 1947, uh, regarding listening the broadcast uh, on the UN declaration of division of Palestine and you know acceptance of creation of the Jewish state uh, in Palestine, which is again you know this Eretz Israelism, as uh, some researchers call it, or Palestinianism, or general sympathy towards Eretz Israel Jewish project that stemmed beyond the you know. Uh, Zionism and sympathies uh, to the to, uh, to the Zionists. Of course, uh, until now, everything what I said, uh, you know, seemed like you know there was a perfect and beautiful life in Jerzoniu for Rihbach, yes, uh, after the Holocaust. But of course, it's not true. The things were not so easy, not so nice. And first thing that I want to say today, and I'm really studying it thoroughly, uh, I will study thoroughly in my book, is that um, the public culture or the public culture that was allowed, enabled, and very much controlled by the communists, uh, communists uh, Jewish and non-Jewish communists who were dominant from the, from the very beginning, they were dominating the, the public sphere, they uh, have the ultimate control. Now, uh, on the right corner, you can see picture of the Bundist headquarters uh, in the town, in Gerzoniów, that were actually um, placed in a market square, in a central, central, market, central square of the town. Uh, the, there were their Bundist political head, headquarters and the place called Arbeterwinkel, that is, you know, the, the labor, laborer's corner, very much reminding the same Arbeterwinkel that was place next to the Bundist headquarters in Interwar Warsaw. But at the same time, above, you can see, you can see the, the slogan, uh, Bundist slogan calling everyone to vote three times yes in a Polish uh, referendum organized by the communists in June 1946. I don't want to, I don't want to go to the communist, to the referendum itself, but in general, it was a, <coughs> um, event organized by the communist uh, authorities in order to avoid the free elections. And it was falsified referendum that was supposed to manifest the uh, all Polish society support for the communists. And uh, on the left, you can see a leaflet that was actually distributed by the Bund 
uh, in Lower Silesia uh, at the time during the referendum. And this amazing leaflet I have found actually in Evo archives in, in the Evo collection. Uh, and it's it's called, uh, it's saying yes, Jews behind the the people who say no in the referendum, the Hitlerist murders are hiding, and it calls everybody to vote three times yes in the referendum. So actually, this is the example showing that Jews had no other choice, and including all the political parties, very critical uh, regarding the communists, that is, Bundists, uh, Orthodox, or Zionists, had no other choice but in the public sphere, not only to follow the decisions of the communists, but uh, even to copy their rhetorics and political language. Now, this is a very important thing because this very much kind of uh, limited the, the real freedom of the Jewish life uh, in rural Poland. And I just want to add that in Dzerzhonyov, not only Bundis or even Zionists, but even the representatives of Agudat Israel were forced to go around the Jewish houses and agitate uh, people to vote three times yes in the referendum. From the other point of view, what I'm showing in my research, first, uh, first that if you don't look into the Polish archives and official documents, but to the correspondence, the internal correspondence of Zionist organization or of Bund that was sent abroad or brought abroad to Israel or to United States, you can see that there was a very strong crit criticism and awareness of the communist domination. Um, presented by the many many Jewish activists who are not communists, but, uh, but and you can see also they had no other choice but to publicly follow the authoritarian rule, but internally being very critical about it. Another thing is that actually the transnationalists until 1948, the very lively and daily connections on the official and private level that all these people had to their families, friends, and activists coming to Dzerzhonyu from United States, France, and Eretz Israel enabled them to get the information outside the communist censorship or pass the information about what is really happening in Poland beyond the communist censorship and beyond or behind the official confirmation, um, um, official communist narrative. And I'm showing it actually also an example of the discourse, official and unofficial discourse regarding the Kielce pogrom. Because, of course, Dzerzhonyov is far away from Kielce, but first of all, uh, I interviewed and I have also interviews with many people who lost their relatives in the Kielce pogrom, and also some of the victims of Kielce pogrom were actually, after a short time in which brought also to Dzerzhonyov, and of course, the Kielce pogrom had Im and a big emigration, flight of the Jews from Poland in summer of 1946, had the impact on all Polish Jewish community, including the uh, community uh, of Dzerzhonyk. Uh, so uh, to sum up this part of my talk, and I'm going to uh, shortly close, I'm already, you know, one slide, two slides before the end, uh, that I, what I wanted to say is actually that it was, it was not the Selavi, it was not the beautiful life, yeah? It was you no know, life in a communist, uh, communist country that became more and more authoritarian, and that had this, you know, complicated uh, the life in which there was this complicated relationship between the uh, between the Jewish community, conditions in which we, it was living, and the communist uh, rule and the communist regime. And what I wanted to say is that most of the representatives of Jewish community, in order to continue their life in Poland or even be in, um, in Poland until the present time, uh, time until we be able to emigrate, they had to do it through this cooperation or official at least cooperation with the regime because they had uh, simply no uh, other choice. Of course, also one needs to mention, I'm also writing a lot about many Jewish communists who are firmly believing they're building a brand new beautiful world in Poland, a world in which it will be possible to be a communist and the Yiddish speaking Jew, and at the same time being integrated in a new Polish society. And uh, uh, as I'm also showing in the book, this belief, of course, also drastically ended, or at least it was you know, very much a kind of received a very heavy blow in 1948, 1939, when the Stalinist system was uh, introduced. And now I'm moving um, to the last slide uh, that I want to show, but again, my presentation is blocked. Just a second. Uh, yeah. 
Mm. Um, I am um, also, of course, um, very much research the Polish Jewish relations. And then again, you have a very different accounts on, uh, on them. One is very optimistic, that is exemplified here by the correspondence of the Chicago News in August, from August 1947. That correspondent of the Chicago News writes actually that in this, you know, special conditions of Lower Silesia, and post Holocaust Jerzoniów, uh, you have uh, actually, you know, the anti Semitism was liquidated. But uh, actually, what I'm showing, you know, Jerzoniów or now Polonized Lower Silesia is not so very much different than uh, all other parts of Poland in terms of, you know, anti Semitism or some continuations of the patterns of pre war and Holocaust anti Semitism that, was, uh, that were, of course, also, you know, present in the daily life of the Jerzoniów Jewish community. And you can see here, you know, one of the uh, speeches that on um, one, one of the, you know, words, you can see example of words that were said during the official meeting of the uh, local uh, officials in July 1945, uh, you know, basically repeating, you know, basically very sympathetic, you know, to the Holocaust that uh, took place in Poland. I also just want to mention that uh, also in Dzierżoniów and uh, nearby Bielawa, as in many other uh, places of Poland, you had uh, the, the same rumors regarding the Jews um, kidnapping the Christian kids and wanting uh, you know, to kill them, for, uh, to take their blood from Atsa. And actually there was an attempt, you know, maybe not the attempt, but there was this gossip and there was a threat of similar pogrom that happened in Kielce uh, also here, but it was very um, fast stopped by the Jewish self-defense unit who, who like uh, cooperating with the local militia had, fall, uh, had caught the people spreading the rumors and stopped, you know, the event um, before it um, very much uh, developed. But from the third point of view, you have, of course, this very dense and very intense uh, daily Polish-Jewish relations taking place in schools, in factories, in cooperatives, in offices, uh, in this very new uh, kind of, you know, social economic reality in which, and I forgot to say it at the beginning, Jews became become also factory workers, they uh, take also official posts, uh, around half of the Jewish kids doesn't go to the, the uh, Jewish schools, but goes to the po Polish state schools. And this actually was already happening in rural Poland. So you have all these very different spaces of interactions of Polish Christian or Polish Jewish interactions in which some of the interwar patterns, both good and bad, of you know, normal or positive daily relations, also of bad relations, stereotypization and antisemitism, you had continuations in uh, all of these spheres. Uh, also on the level of Polish-Jewish relations, and also some novelties. Novelties stemming up from the fact that it was a new political and social economic reality, especially in a change of the Jewish social, social economic structure that took place in the post-Holocaust Poland. And I'm actually coming to the end because I'm very much forward to your questions of critical remarks. Uh, I just wanted to say that in order to do that, what I attempted to do is go out uh, from the Polish archives to use them very much. That is the archives of the Polish institutions or of the Jewish institutions that state in Poland uh, were created to the, uh, to, for the official use, but also go very much to the archives there today in the United States, including Kibo archives and Israel and a few other places because they contain uh, uh, documents of all of the Zionist organizations that were taken over from Poland in 1950. They contain the documents created by the Jewish activists, by JDC, Jewish Labour Community, but Hatzala and other, all other institutions, created not for the Polish communist usage, that is created, you know, for the usage there in the, you know, in the world outside the censorship, that is, they give a very different account of the on, on the Jewish life. For example, they show much stronger presence of religion and of Orthodox life. About which I did not get time to speak about, but it was also present in the job. So overall, this kind of attitude or this kind of perspective gives me an opportunity to create a much richer picture of the Jewish life after the Holocaust, also in which uh, the Polish uh, Holocaust survivors will be much more subjective or 
I would say differently, much more empowered, you know, much more in control of their life after that tremendous strategy. And what I attempt here to do is what was done uh, by other researchers in case of um, Jewish refugees in Dibikat, by researchers such as uh, Zermankovic, Rabino Abad, or Attila Grossman regarding the Jews who stayed after the war for some time in Germany. I, what I also try to do is to reintegrate the uh, Holocaust and Holocaust aftermath studies into the Jewish history. And what, what I actually try to do uh, to this issue uh, also is to reintegrate of the st uh, of, uh, st to, or to integrate Holocaust and Holocaust of the aftermath studies in Poland with the Polish history and history uh, of the Cold War. And I wanted to thank you very much for your uh, attendance, for listening to this talk, and I very much uh, look forward for your questions and remarks. As I said, I'm now writing the book, so any any remarks, both critical and positive, will help me very much to make this book better. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Camille. That was really fascinating. Um, I think, you know, as you said, typically we think of uh, uh, the post-Holocaust period as uh, Jews being in DP camps, and yet here you have uh, a town that uh, in a way serves many of the same functions, but with the hope that there's a type of future in Poland uh, for many of these Jews. And um, it's, uh, it's, I think it's not, it's clearly not the typical scenario. Um, and I was kind of wondering what, uh, uh, how you fell into this topic. How did you, how did you find this uh, and, and what drew you to it? I think I'll also in part, in connection to this, uh, even before, you know, in the interwar period, the trajectory of uh, Jewish life in Poland was toward larger cities. So the fact that people chose to, to move to this smaller town is also very, it's very interesting. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering how you feel about these, these issues. Should I answer right away or we collect some questions or should I? Um, if you want to collect them, we can. Um, do you want to do it that uh, way? You, uh, you know better how it works, you know. Uh, um, you, you know, you can, you, can, you can answer this and then I'll go to the questions. Okay, so I'll try to, uh, I will try to, because these are, uh, these are three great questions or, uh, and I would love to, you know, to talk a lot about it, but also, you know, as much as I would love to give a long answer, I also, you know, would love to answer other questions. I know that we have, we have still only more 20 minutes. So very shortly, how I fell on the topic, I myself was born and raised in Jerzon. Ah. Uh, although uh, my um, family story is totally disconnected from the story I was speaking, my parents came with me in my mother's belly in 1981 in Jerzoni, to Jerzoni from Odessa, from Soviet Union. And how it happened that my, yeah, it's a complicated story, but so I kind of came to the town, I was raised in a town, and uh, since in high school I was in contact with the uh, local Jewish community, and I heard all these stories by the veterans, yes, by the people who still, you know, were raised in Italy Poland and were, you know, veterans of all of this process. I listened to their stories with a great disbelief. And just, you know, while um, writing my dissertation and being from Dzerzhonyov, I knew that the Polish Museum is built in Warsaw, and they were looking, asked me to do some small research on Dzerzhonyov for them, you know, for the sake of their main exhibition. And I just saw how big story is there, and I just knew that this would be my postdoctoral project. So that's how I got into the topic. The second thing that you said about this uh, future. Now, what I'm writing in a book, and very thank you very much for kind of pointing it out, is that I'm not writing that in 46 or 47, anyone from Jews living in Jerzon, or from uh, people living abroad, is 100% sure there is a beautiful future for Polish Jews. It's ambivalence. Is this, this is this feeling of, you know, we really don't know what will happen, uh, what will happen, where we'll be in half a year, in you know, one year. But actually, that's the feeling of all the post-Holocaust survivors all around the world. You know, especially in the first year Holocaust, you cannot think in a different way. What is fascinating, they were using very much also, of course, the interviews made in 80s, 90s, and 2000s, 
And in cases of some of these people, I have also their letters or their correspondence from the 1940s. And you can see, you really see this very, very big difference between the way how you tell your story in 50 years, that you know what happened and you kind of interpret everything in one straight line. And then you are very ambivalent in your correspondence in 46, 47, and you wonder, should I go to the DP camp? It's very dangerous. What will happen there? Should I stay here? Uh, so, so this is what I'm actually showing this uh, ambivalence, whether to stay or whether to go, what is the best for us and for our children? And how, and this ambivalence just develops trees in the certainty. And what I'm actually showing that, you know, history is not fixed. It's not one directional, it's not a logical, it could go very different ways. And this ambivalence is the part of the story. Now, last, last, uh, last thing that you raised, it's a fascinating remark about the tendency already in, in the world Poland, but also all over the Jewish world in the 20th century towards the metropolization, migrating to the big metropolis, sending people, if it's possible, for higher high school and higher education, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is true. And actually, this is one of the elements of kind of utopianism of this Lower Silesian project. And, uh, and one of these interesting paradoxes is that, as you, as you for sure know, and some of our listeners also know, that there were still some Yiddish writers, mostly communists, but still living in Poland. Some of them even stayed after 1950, that were mainly living in Warsaw. In Warsaw, you had all these Yiddish publication houses, Yiddish book and press, and such. Now, this was this paradox that Yiddish intelligentsia was living in a space that were no, there, there were no almost Yiddish readers and, uh, and Yiddish speakers. And the people who would read them and talk to them were living in Lower Silesia. And this shows the contradiction. This shows kind of utopianism. Actually, uh, also, I have this last chapter, which will be post scriptum, a very short kind of you know, story of what happened after 1950. And after 1950, until Gobu Kali, that is until 1956, around 4,000 people stayed. What you can really see that these people, exactly according to this, what you are saying, were migrating to Warsaw or to Wrocław, or at least they were sending their children to high schools and universities. So again, you have not only the process of urbanization, but also the process of professionalization happening to the Polish Jewish community, that is exactly the same process that at the same time takes place in the United States. Of course, there are some differences, but in general, this is no process along the same lines. Now, what it allows me to do, show a little bit the exotic the Polish Jewish Holocaust story happening, showing that besides these people being Holocaust victims, they were also you know, creative, they were also subjective, and their life, followed also some patterns that we know from general world Jewish history, that, we, that not everything was about suffering and about the post-Holocaust aftermath. Nevertheless, I, I very much saw how strongly present Holocaust trauma was inside this community. Well, thank you. Um, it's so interesting to know that you're from Jerzhonyev. Uh, that, I guess, makes perfect sense in a certain way. Um, yeah, and, and some people have asked and you just sort of answered it about how many Jews are left in Jerzhonyev today, um, you know, possibly very few. Um, and also people, other people asked, um, you know, how many remained uh, after the early 1950s. Um, you know, this, this is, there, there are a number of people who have asked, uh, asked this question. Um, and one person, you, you reference interviews that you did. Um, someone is asking um, if you could, if you can give some uh, examples from some of the interviews with individuals who lived in the town during this period. Um, you know, I think this is interesting because they're living in a town that's kind of seeing a type of rebirth. Uh, and so, you know, if, if they're there during the, the you know, late 1940s. Um, so that's, um, that's interesting. Another person asks, um, uh, and you know, there's an interesting parallel here with with DP camps, who uh, many of which were funded by Jewish organizations from the United States and elsewhere. Um, someone is asking if the, the you know there's this wide variety of organizations that uh, are are supporting the community. How how are they interacting with with each other? Do they cooperate or or do they? Um, you know, do they, do they find difficulties? Um, 
I, you know, why don't you try to answer those and then we'll get to more questions after that. Yes, again, great questions and not much time to answer. So shortly, how many Jews were, uh, are left and you know what happened after 1950? So uh, answering the first question, uh, still in the end of 1990s, in a, I remember like evening, it was Pesach or Purim, I don't remember what exactly, uh, or both, I think it was. Yeah, I was both on Pesach and both on Purim, but I did, I don't uh, uh, remember exactly. Was it Megillat Esther or was it uh, No Haggadah? Read it was read by the you know old communist veteran uh, Moises or Moses or Moshe Yakubovich, who was you know one of the pioneers from 1945. He would read it both in Hebrew and in Yiddish, and you had these 50 old people still in the end of 19, uh, uh, 1990s. Would be in between them, you know, chatting Yiddish in the Jewish social cultural organization. Now, all of these people in the last 20 years passed away, and I was, you know, wise or adult enough to interview them. Only a few of them uh, between 2010 and 2019, and besides one lady that she's still in Jerzhonyov and she's still active and remembers 1940s. All these people passed away in the last uh, 20 years, and I made interviews with them. Most of their children, grandchildren, or emigrated, uh, started to emigrate. Many of their children emigrated in 1968, uh, leaving their parents who did not want to leave behind, uh, or migrated to the big Polish cities, uh, according to the pattern that I described uh, previously. Now, in general, in 1950, you have 4,000 people. Then 65% uh, of them lives uh, during the Komukalia in 1956. After experience of Stalinism, most of the people are not, you know, not uh, ready to stay in Poland. More also, you need to remember that we all know the events of March 1968, anti-Semitic events in Poland, but in terms of physical violence and not violence performed towards Polish Jewish elites in Warsaw, in many places, you know, in, in March 1968, but physical violence performed, uh, like um, uh, physical violence towards, you know, the simple Jews, workers, artisans, and such, this violence was even bigger in 1956, following the so-called Tau and the collapse of Stalinist regime as Jews were blamed, you know, for the Stalinism in, in Poland. And many of these people, after the experience of 1956, and this 1956, this violence had also place in the town, and decided to emigrate. So after 1956, you have a community smaller than 1,000 people, but still, you know, kind of vivid and a visible community. And of course, most of these people live uh, after the March 1968 events. And you had more than 100 people staying after 1968. And then, you know, the age and demography in the next 50 years, you know, makes these people... Uh, um, causes that these people pass away. Of course, some of the children, great, great children of these people live all around Poland. Some of them I know, some of them I know even from the Jewish youth camps, you know, from 1990s, but they're not living in Jerzon. Uh, some of them actually, you know, made Aliyah, for example, in 2000s, yes, or in 1990s. So, you know, you, you practically almost don't have community. You have some former inhabitants of Jerzon coming back to Israel. One of them uh, bought back and kind of, you know, made from a synagogue cultural center, yes. Some other bought flats and they come for summer to Jerzon. But it's an expat Israeli, former Jerzonic inhabitants community, not, you know, the Polish Jewish community who stayed there uh, through all the time. As for the interviews, I did them around 60. And as I said, I did nine with the... Jerzoniów or Bielawa, there was a similar town next to Jerzoniów, nine of them with the veterans, with the Polish Jews who stayed in the town from, throughout all the time after the Holocaust. But the rest of them I did in the United States and in Israel. Uh, and thanks actually, you know, to the connections that these people had uh, between each other and many friendships that, you know, I built it with these people. I was able to interview people in Washington, D.C., in New York, in uh, Baltimore, uh, and many places, sadly only on the East Coast. Uh, I never reached the West Coast. And the same I did in Israel, but also I have collected many interviews from United States Holocaust Museum collection, from Yad Vashem, 
uh, and from, of course, United uh, USC uh, Spielberg Shaw Foundation, because there are you know hundreds of interviews uh, of the Jewish inhabitants who, who speak about the Holocaust and who speak also about their life in post uh, Holocaust Poland. Last question about the DP camps and interaction. There was, of course, a very strong interaction. Uh, for example, you had the representatives of the Jewish Brigade coming to the DP camps and then going uh, to Poland. You had the joint activists going uh, here and there. Uh, actually, one of very much under research group of sources on this topic are documents uh, of American embassy in Warsaw from the 1940s, because all of these people were interviewed or they were reporting to the American diplomats in the 1940s. And even now, because I'm now staying, writing my book on the fellowship in Munich in Germany, here in Munich they have a copy of these microfilms from uh, American embassy in Warsaw. And I, there is a fascinating correspondence exactly about that, about the context between DP camps and the community in Lower Silesia, about how the goods and people are brought uh, to the borders, to Bricha and through different other channels, how money are brought. And of course, again, this very much interests not only Jews, but also Polish communists, uh, British, because they are very much worried about the um, Jewish immigration to Palestine, or it very much interests American authorities because they are very much uh, are worried or think about you know all these Polish Jews coming to the American occupational zone in Germany, yes, including here, including Bavaria, yes, meaning in Germany. So again, uh, there is the tremendous tra transnational kind of very interesting Cold War and transnational dimensions uh, dimension of this research. They try to show uh, in my book. And thus, I would very much uh, like to thank for this fascinating question. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, a couple other questions uh, that we can get to. One person asked if your family still lives in Jer uh, Um And... <laughs> Another person asked if there are, uh, what, what remains of the Jewish community there? Are there buildings, are there landmarks? To, is there anything like uh, that, uh, that commemorates the, the, uh, the community? Uh, and also um, we have a question about uh, the nature of uh, people who came there uh, in the immediate aftermath of the war. Uh, in particular, uh, Jews who uh, lived at the war in uh, the Central Asian republics of the Soviet Union, uh, and how that experience affected them in in you know as residents of uh, Georgia. Oh, wow! Amazing questions. <laughs> yeah, especially the last one. But it, yeah, it, so really some of these people know you. <laughs> Just yeah, I understand. Not mentioning I, understand. Yeah. I kind of, you know, yeah, because, yeah, the, the, okay. So my parents are still living in Jerzoniów. I moved out, live in Wrocław. My brother lives in Warsaw, but my parents uh, still live in the town. And we actually visit them two weeks from now. Uh, what state? What state? Uh, there is a Jewish cemetery. And I was present on the last, uh, how you say, funeral? Yeah, on the last funeral of the last person from the community that is a gingo that I, of course, interviewed a few years ago, who passed away two years ago. It was the last you know, funeral made in the cemetery. And then also synagogue state. There is now a private cultural center commemorating the Jewish community of the town. And uh, these are the only two Jewish spaces that are commemorated. The town, and there is a, I, I would, you know, there is a, it's a big topic why the rest of the, uh, of this life is not so much commemorated in the town. Uh, I think it's a, from uh, little different reasons than why, you know, that, that why some people, Jewish life is not so much commemorated in the central Poland, or it's even much more commemorated in central Poland than it's now in Lower Silesia. And I think it's mainly due to the fact that still more today's Poland does not know how to deal with the communist past, how to narrate the communist past outside the white, uh, black and white, you know, image. So also, you know, commemorating the Jewish community that was living in, during the communism and was building this life, it's not easy and it's not done. Now, people from the Central Asia or from Siberia, later of uh, Central Asia, they were the dominant in a post-Jewish community, of course, you know, that, that People who survived Holocaust in German camps in Germany or in camps or in hiding in Poland were the minority. Uh, so, of course, the experience 
So Soviet experience during the war was crucial for the life uh, in Dzierżoniów. It was crucial on many dimensions. It was crucial on the level of Holocaust commemoration. It was crucial also on the level of that they, they really understood and knew what the communism is. And you can really see how much this experience that they brought from Soviet Union affected their, their, their way their way in dealing with reality in 1946 and very much affected their reaction towards Stalinization in 1948-49. Because they exactly knew what it means and in which direction things are going. And they were very eager, including many communists actually, who came from Soviet Union, to, to apply uh, to emigrate to Israel in 1949 because of that experience. So of course, this Soviet experience had, you know, meaning on all the dimensions that I described today, but, but just simply, I just don't, don't have all this time to, uh, to speak about. But I just wanted to say to all of you and to some friends and including, you know, these amazing survivors to whom I interviewed, that all these stories and all your stories will be in the book that I'm now writing. I see how great all these you know, points and memories are, and they're all or there, what I want to say that these general things that I um, said now, they will be exemplified to this microchemical study, to the stories of certain st place and of certain people who, whom I interviewed and who were interviewed by different other people. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Camille. Uh, this was really, really, truly fascinating. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, but we got to a lot. And um, we very much look forward to your forthcoming book uh, on this topic. Uh, it's it's really quite fascinating, and I think uh, the the audience thought so as well. Um, thank you for uh, giving this lecture. Uh, we we loved having you as a fellow. Uh, thank you. To also to the audience for joining us. Um, we, um, again, this is a, a YIVO Fellowship lecture. Uh, YIVO Fellowships can't, uh, can't uh, support our researchers unless uh, you donate to us. So please, uh, if you liked what you heard today, uh, please consider making a donation to YIVO. Uh, thanks so much and uh, have a good day. Take care. I just wanted to say that the book will be published first in Polish, but then in English. And I wanted to thank you very much for your attendance and for listening to this stuff. Thank you. Okay. Thanks to everyone.